even if you don't understand how to move chess pieces, what you have here is the phenomenon of how we define ourselves in relationship to the machine. The machine has a name, Deep Thought. It's the computer world champion of chess. Across the board is Garry Kasparov, the human champion. Maybe the best chess player who's ever lived. I mean, the idea of this match is much wider than chess itself. It's a man versus the computer. And right now, I'm watching this enormous development of the computers, I mean, people probably have this fear. It's, 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 it's very deep still, but it's a fear. Who knows? Probably in the future, computer will replace us. I mean, we'll control our life. And uh, uh, chess is probably the only, uh, uh, the only act uh, kind of activity, human activity, when we can compare our ability and computers. This has never happened before, not at this level of the game. A game that's come to represent the complexity and intelligence of the human mind, the ability to think. In this arena, man has been unchallenged until now. It is nice to think that no matter what these wonderful computers can do, they can't beat me at my game by George, and that's gone. Uh, or rather, it's rapidly coming to a close. We never thought that a computer would play at grandmaster level. And here's one already doing it. Chess may be only a game, but not for the grandmaster or for the scientist. But I think the whole notion of man versus machine, uh, you know, it goes really to the heart of human instinct because we invented the machine. It's our creation. And in some sense, to have this machine be better than us, I mean, this, this is almost a foreboding of a lot of the things that have happened in science fiction stories that uh, we put off as being mere fantasy. But uh, un unfortunately or fortunately, depends on your point of view, these days may not be that far away. On this day, a game of chess has stirred new possibilities and old feelings. The same emotions have been aroused whenever one talks about computers thinking. And that, in turn, it seemed to me to have something to do with the fact that many human beings seem to get their feeling of dignity, worth, self-respect out of some notion that the human species is different from everything else, from some idea of uniqueness. And of course, then, if you take away some kind of uniqueness, that's very upsetting. And I guess there were some guys who were very upset when Galileo said, or Copernicus, you know, you aren't right in the center of things. In the moments before their match, the adversaries are at the center of a brave new world of chess and the microchip. Like fighters before a title bout, they're pressed for clues to the outcome and meaning of their confrontation. I think, I think you're right, but, but one has to be a good tactician and very patient. You got no, that, that, no that, that, that's true. That, that's why I said that it, if computer is much more powerful, it's a one billion. Do you feel bad that what you, what you may be doing is like taking away the human creative you know, soul? I don't think it's taking away the human creative soul. In the sense, we are doing creating something that's human, try to duplicate the human's behavior, in some sense. You know, trying to create a super, super, you know, thing that's unhuman, that's better than humans. Can you do so? With trying to build something that's better than all humans in a specific domain. Now, what does that do unclear? But doesn't that necessarily have broader implications? No, it's not necessary at all. Well, yeah. Because the chess, you have to win the chess game. If you can win, I mean, 70% or 75 or 60. I, I thought what's, it was what's very... The, what's the reason? Yes. I thought of Kasparov was sweating a little. He's talking about representing the human race. Well, I would prefer to think of Kasparov as a willing participant in the experiment trying to measure the human limitation in chess intelligence. Okay, we're ready to start. Could we have quiet, please? The experiment is being conducted at the New York Academy of Art, an unlikely laboratory for what became a media event. I'd like to introduce the protagonists. First of all, from Carnegie Mellon University, where, where they created this. Uh, they're now at IBM, incidentally. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce the men and the brains behind Deep Thought. 
Murray Campbell, and uh, Fang Chang Su. Hey, can you describe what it was like the day you played Kasparov, what the atmosphere was like in that room? Hostile. <laughs> Hostile. It seemed like almost all the people there were rooting for Kasparov, except for maybe a few people in computer science who were rooting for the computer. Well, I was at Carnegie Mellon, where the actual computer was located at the time, and we had a small room set aside for spectators, so we assumed they'd all be, you know, people who are familiar with Deep Thought and who would root for Deep Thought, but even there, almost no one was rooting for Deep Thought. Almost everyone was hostile. And now, I'd like to introduce a very young man, incredibly young for what he's accomplished, from Baku in the USSR, a man who at 26 can, can very reasonably claim, and he's being heralded as such, as the greatest chess player in history. I'd like to introduce the champion of the entire world in chess, the world champion, Garry Kasparov. I mean, this is something. This is an event, Kasparov. Uh, there, there's been no one like him in the chess world since Fisher that generates this kind of emotion, you know, it's sort of hero, hero worship, uh, you know, bad guy, bad boy kind of, kind of, you know, emotions that uh, he, he's just perfect to be the first person to go in, you know, the first world champion to go in with uh, the emerging strong chess programs. Gary, if you were to lose in the next few years to some super machine, what effect do you think the loss by the world champion to a machine will have on chess as a creative and as a business enterprise? You mean within the next, next so, five years? Yeah. Well, whatever. Okay, thank you. It means that I will be world champion for the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for this compliment. Yeah, I understand. Uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll find enough ability, human ability, to uh, fight, especially against a computer. But if computer beats one day, mm, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> I, I don't think that chess uh, will be stopped. But uh, uh, it will be very unpleasant, not only for the chess players, but uh, for the human race it, it itself, because it means that you, you can provide better mind than the human one. A thought unpleasant to some has inspired others who would turn smoke and fire and metal into a mechanical grandmaster. This French film, The Chess Player, told the story of an 18th century Hungarian nobleman who claimed to have done just that a hundred years before Frankenstein's monster. The idea has always attracted a crowd, as it did at the royal courts of Europe whenever the Turk came to play. Then as now, the claim that a machine could think for itself had to be proven to a skeptical audience. What the public saw was a complex automaton whose gears and levers were carefully charted and studied. The Turk was one of the most popular and successful chess players on the continent. King smiled, so did the inventor. But not Napoleon, who it said was beaten in 19 moves. Turk had many imitators. Mephisto, the marvelous mechanical chess player. Ajib, the greatest wonder of the 19th century. But there was one thing all these early mechanical players had in common. Concealed inside the machine or in a nearby room, a human chess master operated the controls. They were all fakes. The first machine that could play on its own didn't appear until early in the 20th century. This chess contraption of pulleys and weights of wires and electromagnets could play a simple end game and find the winning move every time. 
That's where automated chess stayed until the 1950s and the electronic age. As far as machines are concerned, uh, chess became very early on uh, a challenge to see how far we could carry computer programming into the realms of what is usually regarded as human intelligence. And chess is usually regarded as something that requires deep thought. I guess that's why they named the program that. Um, so it, it seemed to be a very good area in which to uh, test our ideas of how you can program a computer to be intelligent. Our research work has as its prime motive the investigation of human thinking processes using the electronic computer and also the game of chess. It was provocative, promising, and primitive. In 1959, the idea was to create an artificial intelligence, a machine that thinks the way a human thinks. The is now being given the instructions to prepare its next move. It is in its thinking process now, which lasts for approximately six seconds. 3,000 individual calculations have been done. The machine indicates its move by means of the console light, which indicated that it has moved the pawn one square forward. One square led to another, and another. For computer scientists, it was an intriguing challenge, since chess depends on a well-defined set of rules and a finite, if immense, range of possibilities. It was programmable. And once a machine could be programmed to play, why not to win? That was human nature. It's been a dream, one of the initial dreams of computing science uh, since computers were, were first invented 40 years ago. To be able to build a machine, or in those days, write a program that could defeat the human world chess champion. It was just posed as an interesting problem. And it's been 40 years that we've been working very hard on this problem. At first, programmers thought they could succeed by imitating the human player. But by the late 1970s, as computers grew more powerful, scientists began to rethink how the computer game could approach the highest level of play. To beat humans at their own game, it would have to be done the computer's way. You think that the human mind is something special, it's more than just a machine. And uh, when you're beat by a machine at something that's considered to be the epitome of intellectual, intellectual activity, something something happens I mean either either the notion of intelligence or chess or something has to change when this happens this may be a place to study the nature of problem solving the potential of the computer but that's not on the mind of Gary Kasparov as he sits down to begin play against the first computer good enough to challenge a world champion I'm going to start the clock now everyone be be quiet and uh, no more talking, please. In the game of chess, every move counts, forming a pattern of attack or defense. The power and role of each piece is determined by its relationship to other pieces on the board. A pawn may be the weakest piece, but on the right square at the right time, it can threaten a king. Both man and machine have the same goal how in every position to find the best possible move, but they won't find it in the same way. Kasparov calls upon every resource of memory and knowledge, of imagination and inspiration. Deep Thought does what a computer does best, crunches numbers, millions of them. Computers deal with ones and zeros and add and subtract. The Grandmaster deals with initiative, momentum, attacks, defenses. Um, he can't even explain some of the things that he did. If you ask Gary Kasparov why he made a certain move, he'll say, well, it was just the right move.